Hello, and welcome to another Clayton County Library System virtual program. Today we have Ms. Kiana Leverit from Georgia Audubon, who will be sharing tips on how we can create a sanctuary in our own backyard, specifically for the bird watchers. Ms. Kiana. Thank you for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kiana. I am the education program coordinator for Georgia Audubon. And I have a background in environmental education and natural resource management, along with a degree from Tuskegee University in Alabama. And I'm so excited to be sharing this message with all of you today. So with that being said, I can go ahead and get started. We're gonna be talking about creating a sanctuary for wildlife in your yard or wherever you live. So really, really quickly, I want to acknowledge the other member of Georgia Audubon who has direct hands in our efforts for conservation. His name is Gabe Anderley. And should you have any questions or comments or any tips and tricks after this presentation, you can reach out to me, but I also would encourage you to reach out to him too, because he is a wealth of information. A little bit about Georgia Audubon. We are the region's premier organization dedicated to the preservation and enjoyment of birds. We were formerly known as Atlanta Audubon and very recently went statewide. So that was very exciting for us. And through our organization, we offer free field trips around Metro Atlanta, bird and nature workshops for curious minds, outreach programs for all ages and all accessibility levels, as well as many volunteer opportunities and professional development. And through our conservation efforts, we also have a hand in educating the local and surrounding communities about our projects such as Project Safe Light, our habitat restoration efforts, as well as certification programs and educating others on how they can create spaces for wildlife in their spaces like we are doing today. So our mission is to build places where birds and people thrive and we approach our work through conservation, education, and community engagement. As of today, since 1970, one in four birds are gone. One in four out of every bird that has ever existed is gone and there has been a steady decline of the amount of birds that you see in the United States or even in the world at all. Two thirds of the North American birds are at risk of extinction from global temperature rise. And the four main causes of this or really the biggest cause of this is habitat decline, habitat loss. A habitat is a place that offers food, shelter, water and space for an organism. So for you, your home is like your habitat, but for a bird or for another animal, the outdoors are their habitat. And as we are developing into a steadily urban environment around us, their habitats of trees and nature are getting smaller and smaller. And although Atlanta is the city in the trees. There are still things that you and I can both do to make sure that we are helping all the other organisms that share the spaces that we also call home. Many of the threats that have caused bird populations to decline are caused by humans. There are about 3 billion fewer birds in North America than there were in 1970 and even common beloved species the ones that we're used to seeing every day are also in decline. So the answer to this problem that you and I can really, really help with is creating habitat connectivity. And it's considered to be one of the most important factors in maintaining biological diversity, which is making sure that the habitat, again, which is the food, shelter, water, and space is diverse and creative and preserving ecosystems as they move to keep pace with the changing climate and urbanization. 
So I want you to take a look at this picture that I have up on the screen and think to yourself that those large, tall gray squares are city skyscrapers and buildings. And the colorful squares with the triangles on tops could be people's homes and the large green circles are green spaces. So if you have your friend, the American goldfinch living in one area and he lives around many other birds in that same area, it's gonna be really, really difficult for him to find enough food for himself because he's sharing his habitat with many, many other bird species, including other goldfinches, other common backyard birds, such as blue jays, cardinals. He has to deal with hawks and, and sparrows. And food is a main issue. And when you live in these small spaces and you're sharing it with a lot of other organisms, the food availability becomes smaller and smaller. So looking at this picture on the screen, although this is a very extreme example, you'll see that there's a large area of open green pasture and one small strip of land that has trees and fauna and flora where many birds would be able to thrive. They wouldn't be able to adapt to these large pastures because the things that they need, such as trees, such as cover, such as shelter, aren't available. And so they're kind of forced to pair down and share their spaces with other organisms. But if you have habitat connectivity and let's say you decide to plant purple cone flowers in your backyard, and then you tell yourself that you're gonna plant beautyberry bushes on the side of your house. And you have a few neighbors that are doing that as well. And then you also have neighbors that are planting other native plants such as dogwood trees, fringe trees and other different kinds of shrubs, you have your American goldfinch and suddenly he is able to travel almost like creating a bridge to other larger green spaces where he is less cramped. There are more resources for him to take advantage of. There's more water and there's more access to food. So where he's living his best life, he is happy. But this was possible because people in the surrounding area created this connective habitat. So since 1970, we've lost a lot of birds and not just the ones that are rare or the ones that are difficult to find, but the common ones such as our grassland birds or our migratory birds, eastern forest birds, aerial insectivores, and so many more, whether they're birds of prey, waterfowl, all populations are declining because these birds are missing out on essential resources. And seven simple actions that we can all do to help birds are to avoid pesticides in our yards because those pesticides will in turn affect the pests that, well, we call them pests, but they actually are food and, and nutrients for birds and other organisms that live in your yard that you may not even see. You can also plant native plants or use them or find ways to incorporate them into your life, which is what I'm going to highlight today. You can keep your cats indoors if you have cats because they kill up to a million birds every single day. You can make your windows safer. Birds have a habit of flying straight. And when they're migrating, especially at night or during the day, they're unable to see reflective surfaces. So your windows are, can, or can be a danger to these birds. And by making them safer, by breaking up the reflective images, by putting up it's some people will call it bird tape on your windows or by breaking up the space. So if you draw pictures and you put your pictures on the windows, it creates a shape that the bird is able to recognize and he will avoid the window. 
you can also do citizen science, which is kind of taking population into your own hands by just sharing what you see in your yard if you are able to identify the birds, as well as reducing plastic use and drinking shade grown coffee. But today I want to focus on your native plants. So here we have a basic map of Atlanta. And at first you see a few green spaces. You see the Atlanta Botanical Garden, Freedom Park, Central Park, and a few other green areas. But when you actually look at like a bird's eye view, it's a lot more green than we thought it was. So Atlanta being the city and the trees, it's really helpful to have all this green around because the birds in Atlanta love it. Now, there are over a thousand birds in the United States and there are a little over 400 of them at any given time that can be found in Georgia. And around 200 of that 400 birds can be found right here in the city. And so those many species, whether they are waterfowl, hawks, and birds of prey, songbirds, nocturnal birds, wading birds, they all take advantage of these green areas that we see. And although some of them are parks, we see a lot more green because of habitat connectivity and the efforts of the surrounding communities to create more green spaces. So when you think about your backyard or your the space in front of your house or your local green areas, think about it like a sanctuary. A sanctuary is a safe place and we would wanna make sure that all the spaces that we walk into are also safe for the other things that have to live there, whether they are the birds, the squirrels, the possums, and even sometimes the deer some in certain areas. You wanna think about different aspects that would make your wildlife sanctuary great, that would make it functional, that would make it safe, and that would make it the best that it can be for the organisms that are living there. So the first thing you wanna think about are your plants. Plants are the most important part because plants provide the habitat. They provide the food for the, for the animals, whether it's the fruit on the trees or the insects that live in those trees. It could be the flowers that some birds will eat the nectar from, or they can be homes and, and habitats for birds and other animals to lay down roots and plant their and nest and, and fledge their young or, or live for a time. So you wanna think about the kinds of plants you're using. Specifically, native plants are the best kind. You also want to think about structural diversity, food sources, water sources, cover and nesting sites, safe wildlife practices, and having a plan to maintain all the great work that you're doing. So I'm going to talk about each of these. So you can buy plants. I have a great deal of plants in my house that I keep, but are those plants actually good for the birds? Do you have a garden? Do you have a backyard? Think about the plants that you have in your life around you and how helpful are they to birds? So the best plants for these birds, such as the Georgia State bird brown thrasher that's pictured here, are that they're native. The brown thrasher and many other common backyard birds that are found here in the Southeast, such as the Carolina chickadee, such as the tufted titmouse and the blue jay, the American robin, the northern cardinal, the goldfinch. All of these birds are birds that have grown and evolved over time with the plants that are also here that have grown and evolved over time. So they kind of depend on familiar plants to survive. It takes a long time for a species at all to adapt. If it suddenly got really, really hot, it wouldn't be that easy for us to adapt to it being hot all year round, but eventually we would. 
with birds, it's not so simple because they're different and they themselves really have a specific diet, a specific lifestyle that they lead to in order to maintain homeostasis or the act of keeping themselves alive. So native plants play a very large role in that. So as this bird says, we need native plants. And a native plant is a species that has historically occurred as part of a specific ecosystem or natural community. Native plants co-evolved alongside native fauna, which is a scientific term for wildlife, to form intricate relationships. So the plants depend on the birds, but the birds also depend on the plants. If you wanna do some extra reading, I encourage you guys to check out Douglas Tallamy. He has some great literature on how specifically you can sustain wildlife and native plants wherever you live and how you can really bring it home with you. So after this presentation, if you have additional questions or you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to check him out. And on the flip side, just like how you have native plants, you also have invasive plants. And an invasive species is a non-native species whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic harm, environmental harm, or harm to human health. These species grow and reproduce rapidly, causing major disturbances to the areas in which they are present. So although these plants are able to grow in these foreign spaces, they ultimately will take over because they don't have any competition. So when you look at this picture, apart from our friend the deer, you really only see one kind of plant. And that plant is cascading over all of the other plants that are underneath. And then because those plants aren't getting the proper water or sometimes it's, they're too shaded, sometimes they are being strangled by the vines or by the roots of these invasive species to the point where native species aren't able to thrive in the way that they should because they aren't able to protect themselves or defend themselves against invasive species. So that first picture was kudzu, this, which is an invasive species. This second picture I'm showing you, although it looks like a beautiful flower, it's called wisteria. And this is what wisteria does as a woody, viney, invasive plant to local and native plants. They will take over and sort of wrap themselves around other trees, which in turn will really, really cause damage and eventually lead to the death of those trees. Not to mention that the birds that, that may live in those trees will either be homeless or it'll be too thick and too dense for them to live there. And there are also certain invasive species that birds, specifically native birds or migrating birds that come to Georgia every single year are unable to eat. So there are many, many plants that are invasive that you should watch out for. But the ones that I would say are, the, are definitely ones that you should look out for would be privet, bamboo, Bermuda grass, nandina, English ivy, wisteria, which is the beautiful purple flower I just showed you, and kudzu. All of these are the most common, although, and should be removed if they can be removed because they cause ultimate damage to birds. Even, even some invasive species such as Nandina have berries that are ultimately very poisonous to birds. And in terms of a native plant versus an invasive plant, when you look at the two pictures on this page, you're, you're looking at English ivy and Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper is native, while English ivy is not. And 
the biggest thing that I would say is important about planting natives is that because they've grown and evolved with the ecosystem, they're going to bloom at the time when birds need them. They're going to bear fruit at the times of the year when migratory birds are coming to Georgia to look for energy and food to fill them up for their journey to go further south. And plants that are not native and have not evolved with this landscape do not bloom or provide anything of value to birds as they're migrating or to birds that are, year, that are here year round. So when they take over a landscape, they essentially are taking away a food source that potentially is very, very important for our backyard birds. So looking at different habitats and different shrubs, you wanna make sure you have structural diversity. And structural diversity is the key to, no matter where you live, making it the best that it can be. And it's all about layering. So when you look at your habitats and you're looking at your habitat structure and diversity for foraging, shelter, and nesting, look, start from the ground up. Ask yourself, do you have ground cover? Do you have understory? Do you have midstory? Do you have canopy and do you have above canopy? Depending on where you live and how many trees are around you, if you only have grass, they will attract different kinds of birds to your yard. So really, if you have a specific bird that you would like to have in your yard, you can essentially plant the plants that that bird enjoys in order to be able to see them in your yard. So there are a lot of birds that spend time on the ground, such as towhees and, and robins, but also sparrows, wading birds and shorebirds like geese and, and ducks and, and herons. All of these birds love plants that are grown on the ground. And then as you get a little bit off the ground, you're going to have your understory, which can be smaller bushes and, and shrubs. And those are beloved by bluebirds and mockingbirds, cardinals and wrens. You also will have your, your thrasher in there. And then there are birds that love midstory, such as your warblers, your jays, vireos, chickadees, kinglets, like your ruby crown kinglet. And you'll see birds that are birds of prey tend to really, really, and aerial insectivores tend to enjoy the canopy and the above canopy. So that would be your vultures and your hawks and your owls, but also your woodpeckers, your vireos and nuthatches, warblers. And depending on what you have access to, or what, what outcomes you want to see. So if you want to see more bluebirds in your yard, you can think about planting some shrubs, or if you want to see owls, you can think about planting some trees that might grow taller or might present more of a benefit to those kinds of animals. So when you look at this picture, I want you to think about what about it says that this is a good habitat. Keep in mind, a habitat is food, shelter, water, and space. And you wanna make sure that it's diverse and so that there are levels. So not necessarily completely flat, but there are levels of different kinds of plants. And in this picture, you can see that there are, and that it actually is a great habitat because right there at the bottom, you can see that they have a great water source. There's plenty of shelter all around and the larger trees are spaced out to where the birds and all the other organisms have enough space to live around each other, but not, not necessarily be on top of each other. So you'll have your shrubs, you'll have your shorter trees, your understory trees, and then this particular person has a lot of canopy trees as well, 
that are adding to the shade which in turn will bring more birds, it'll bring more insects. And so this is a very birdy, a birdy habitat and a great place for birds. But when you think about your yard, I'm sure you're wondering, what should I plant? If I wanted to see this wood thrush, which is pictured here, what would I plant? And planting for urban species really just depends on where you live. So think about how much sun does the green space that you live with have? Do you get a lot of sun based on where you live or do you not see the sun? What time of day do you get sun? I know personally for me, because I live in an apartment and my apartment is facing away from the sun, where the sun rises, I get most of the sun in my yard for the, towards the end of the day for my plants. So I try to make sure that I pick plants that don't necessarily need a lot of direct sunlight throughout the day. But if you do face where the sun rises, then that would be a different story. And you would want to pick plants that need to be in the sun or that love the sun for many, many hours of the day. So if you have partial to full sun, I'm just gonna read a few of these plants because they're very common and you can buy them at nurseries or plant sales. So I would encourage anything that is an oak. Oak trees are great. So are cedar trees and ash trees. Those are my top recommendations because they support a lot of different kinds of insects. And and specifically caterpillars. And caterpillars and worms are the primary source that birds use to feed their young when they build their nests. So you would wanna pick plants that support more insects because in turn, those plants would attract more birds. So every bird has plants that they absolutely love. So you can pick your plants completely based on what you want to see in your yard. So for example, I know many people are interested in attracting hummingbirds and they put out hummingbird feeders in order to draw them in so that they can get a really close look at these wonderful and majestic birds. But you also, because these birds are pollinators, you can plant flowers that are native, such as coral honeysuckle, your cardinal flowers, your jewel weed that isn't actually a weed, and bee balm. You also, if you, let's say you wanted to plant black-eyed Susans because you knew what plants you wanted to plant, but you didn't know what birds you might see, black-eyed Susans are beloved by your seed eater. So your Carolina chickadees, your American goldfinch, your Eastern towhee, your tufted titmouses, and beautiful indigo buntings. So really, you can find your starting point by starting with the birds, or you can find your starting point by starting with the plants and really just figuring out what kind of goal you want to achieve. So if you want to have more flowers, then that will attract a lot of pollinators versus if you wanted to have more trees and more shrubs, you would attract more thrushes and, and more large and larger birds. So your canopy trees would be your oaks, hickory, sweet gum, tulip poplar, maples, pines, your beech trees, and your ash trees. These are the bird, these are the ones that will attract the most amount of birds. And so pictured here in this picture, starting on the top left, you have a tufted titmouse. Below that, you have a pine warbler. Next to your pine warbler, you have a Carolina chickadee. And above your Carolina chickadee, you have another warbler. And all of the digging into sweet gum balls and all of these birds can be seen where you have large cascading trees. But let's say you live in a place where you can't have big trees and they won't work for you. You can try mid understory trees like dogwood and, and serviceberry, your wax myrtles and your red cedars. 
the devil's walking stick and, and beautiful fringe tree. And those will allow you to see birds starting at the top left, like the Eastern bluebird with its bright blue pigment and its orange breast. You can also see woodpeckers, which is the top right, and cedar wax wings, which are featured on the bottom, and towhees. There are so many different birds that love these kinds of trees. These kinds of trees are typically the ones that also can bear berries and will bloom in the spring. And some will even bloom in the fall, which is great for birds that are migratory, that come to Georgia simply to pass through and are looking to get food and fill their bellies and get energy. But if trees are your thing and you would like a simpler yard and maybe, maybe that's just not for you, then shrubs would be a great option because they are very maintainable. They usually don't tower higher, higher above your actual height. And most, if not all of these, of all of these shrubs will have beautiful berries. And most birds love, love, love berries. So you can plant blueberries or beauty berry, which are those beautiful bright pink, pinkish purple berries on the top left. You can also plant elderberries, which have their own added health benefits for you personally, if you're interested, which would be the berries on the bottom right. And then you have your spice bush and your heart to burst in, which is a native strawberry. And all of these plants have berries and all of them are beloved by birds and they're great options. It's a great place to start with. You can also plant wildflowers, native wildflowers like black eyed Susans and, and goldenrod and milkweed, which are the which is the only plant that monarch butterflies will plant their eggs on. You also have purple cone flowers, which again are beloved by the goldfinch. And then you can also plant bee balm, which although it may attract bees, it'll also attract hummingbirds like the one that you see in the bottom left. So wildflowers, you can kind of plant them and let them do their thing and the birds will soon follow. But let's say you're not much of a planter, but you have a great space. One thing that I like to encourage a lot of people to do is think about the ground in your yard. So how often do you mow? When the leaves fall in the autumn time, do you rake them up or do you let them sit so that other animals can either burrow or sometimes insects can burrow and they become basically buffets for birds. So think about your grasses and your sedges and your ferns and alum root, your wild herbs like ginger and wild mushrooms. You can also think about vines like Virginia creeper muscadine, passion flower, cross vine, all native, all safe, and those will attract hummingbirds and other pollinators. You can also specifically pick host plants like your oaks, which are a great place for, for um, caterpillars, or you can pick plants based on what you want to see that are often specifically host plants for other animals. So like I said, milkweed is great to attract monarch butterflies. In fact, monarch butterflies will only lay their eggs on milkweed plants. So planting host plants to create space for butterflies or create space for worms will ultimately bring more birds to your yard, like aerial insectivores. So when I think of aerial insectivores, I think of chimney swifts, I think of your Eastern Phoebe, I think of your sparrows who will glide through the air beautifully catching insects as they fly. But all of these birds need worms to survive and creating space in your yard 
for the for those insects to thrive will ultimately bring in so many more birds. So habitat, once again, is all about food, shelter, water, and space. And so if you can't plant plants, think about other ways that you can introduce food sources for birds into your yard. Feeders are a great way to bring birds to your yard as long as they are kept clean and, and changed out every once in a while. And planting plants, if that's your thing. So for example, if I wanted to attract hummingbirds, I would plant a lot of wildflowers, I would plant vines, and I would plant some shrubs like Indian pink and cross vine, bee balm, coral honeysuckle, which is pictured in the picture with the hummingbird, and cardinal flower. And hummingbirds, they hover and they need a lot to, uh, to be able to exert that much energy. A hummingbird weighs no more than a penny. And during migratory seasons, they will single-handedly travel from here in Georgia, specifically with the ruby-throated hummingbird, all the way to South America, across the Gulf of Mexico in one trip without stopping. And that, that requires a lot of energy. Can you imagine swimming across the Gulf of Mexico without stopping? How much food do you think you would need to eat ahead of time in order to have enough energy in your body to be able to do that? And hummingbirds need and depend on these plants in order to get all of that energy. They may eat, they may eat a fruit fly here and there, but nectar is their primary source of food. So it's important to kind of create space for birds, depending on what kind of birds you wanna see. So not everyone will have a creek in their backyard or they'll have a pond in their neighborhood. But what you could do is you could create a bird bath. So it doesn't have to be a water stone, it doesn't have to be a traditional bird bath. It can be a tub of water that you change out every once in a while get creative. But by adding that essential part of a habitat to your yard or your green space will also bring, bring in and attract more birds. And when thinking about diversity, you also want to think about cover and nesting. Look at your space and ask yourself, do birds have a place to live where I live? Are, is it diverse? Do I have dead trees and logs? Do I have leaf litter piles or rock piles? Or do I have plants that are gonna be here year round or shrubs? Do my trees have tree cavities? Do I have mature trees? Or even if you really wanna attract birds, do I create, if none of these things are possible, do you create space for them by putting up nest boxes or creating bird houses? Rock piles and brush piles are good places for foraging and finding shelter for many, many birds. Birds often are either very, very colorful or they find ways to blend into their surroundings. And rock piles and rush piles are a great place for these birds to conceal themselves, but also to get their grub on. And natural leaf litter, is an excellent mulch and harbors the invertebrates, the worms that birds need, like, like your brown thrashers and your eastern towhees and your wrens and your sparrows, which are all pictured here. So as fall comes and as the leaves are falling, I understand that not everyone is able to keep their yards uh, with the leaves on the ground, but if you can create leaf litter piles, the next time you decide to rake up your leaves or the next time you decide to even think about mowing your lawn, ask yourself, would this be a great space for birds to live? So here's a picture of a golf course. And when you're looking at this golf course, you can see that the golf course part of it is, is very, very flat. But when you look at the, the green cutaway that they've created, it's so diverse. You've got your 
understory trees. You've got some flowers. You've also clearly have some, some mature, deciduous, and evergreen trees. Deciduous trees are trees that lose their leaves during the fall and then get them back in the spring. And evergreen trees are trees that are green and do not lose their green color when the fall time comes around. These are usually pine trees and needle-like leaf trees. So ground cover is an excellent place for birds. There are certain birds that will scratch the ground and look on the ground specifically when they're looking for food like your American robins. If you ever see an American robin, they're known for their bright, bright orange chests and kind of brown body with a large chest. And most of the time when you find them or you see them, they're on the ground. And that's because that's where the, for them at least, that's where the insects are. You can tell a lot about a bird by what that bird's beak is shaped like. It'll tell you what it eats. So you have your hummingbirds and they have that long beak with the long tongue, and that is used to go deep into flowers, just like how a robin's beak is meant to dig in the ground and grab seeds and grab insects. You also have birds that have very large beaks that allow them to get other kinds of insects and sometimes even small amphibians and reptiles. So, I know oftentimes when you see a dead tree in your yard or your neighborhood, you ask yourself, oh, I wonder when they're going to cut that down. But dead trees are a really great space for birds. Over 30 of the birds in Georgia use nest cavities to either raise their young or their homes. Woodpeckers exclusively nest and live in nest cavities, often ones that they have created. And I like to call them ecosystem engineers because once they create that hole in a tree, whether it's dead or alive, other animals in turn and other birds will come and take over that space once they're finished with it. So you have your, your nut hatches and your chickadees, your bluebirds, and even your owls are all other birds that will use nest cavities and that will live in dead trees. So the next time you see a dead tree, and you're thinking about cutting it down, ask yourself, can I leave the log? Because that tree in itself will create habitat for birds. So look at this picture for a moment and think about what do you see here that would make a great habitat? Is this diverse? Are there levels or does it all look the same? Also, within your spaces, when you leave logs, they in turn can create other forms of life like lichen and mushrooms, which will in turn attract different kinds of species to your yard. If they attract squirrels or they attract possums, then that also in turn might attract red-tailed hawks and, and vultures and red-shouldered hawks as well. So, in terms of what's killing birds in North America, cats are, apart from habitat loss, cats, windows, vehicles, and industrial collisions are a major cause. So when you have all the knowledge that you have now in order to create a great space for the wildlife that lives around you so that you can share that space. It's also important to have a plan about how you're going to maintain it and how you're going to keep wildlife safe in general while also doing what it is you want to achieve. So some of the things that you can do in order to have safe wildlife practices are not feeding or maintaining outdoor cats. Oftentimes when we see a stray cat, a stray dog, somebody thinks to wonder, oh, I wonder whose dog that is. Let me call animal control or let me like try to get the dog and figure out who's, 
it is, but that really doesn't happen as often as it does with dogs, as it would, should with cats. Cats will reproduce at an alarming rate and they will hunt purely for sport sometimes at the expense of birds. And like they kill over a million birds every single day, annually about 2.6 billion. Another thing you can do is minimize the outdoor lighting because birds that fly and migrate at night will use the stars in order to navigate where they're going. And if there's too much light pollution, then it's easy for them to get lost. You can also to use little to no chemicals on your yard because if you spray pesticides or insecticides on your lawn and you have ants or spiders or worms living in your lawn and then a bird, maybe a bird that you enjoy seeing, eats that worm that has been sprayed with pesticides, then that bird can potentially get very, very sick. Bird collisions are also very common, but in some cases they are preventable by creating reflective spaces so that birds are able to break up clear window-like images. And again, to just make sure that you're shutting your lights off, as well as using your, having limited use of your lawn mowers and your leaf blowers because taller lawns and leaf piles create great habitat for birds. So thinking about your sanctuary, that space, just as if you had a pet tortoise or parrot or you have a cat or a dog, your wildlife sanctuary can persist for a long time as long as you take care of it. But it's important when you're taking care of it to have a plan. So once you plant your plants and you figure out which birds you want to attract, you want to think about if I need to remove any non-native, any invasive species, because if they are still present, then they can ultimately truly harm the plants that you've just taken the time to plant. You can also make sure that you're cleaning and refilling your water sources and your nest boxes and your feeders if you have them and keeping the space human friendly so that you enjoy it too because your habitat, your home is your habitat, but your yard is, is still your habitat, but you also share that space. So it's important to think about what you can do. And if you're wondering where you can start, you can start with a local green space, one that you enjoy. Go there, see what birds live there, figure out what kind of plants they're planting as an example and take it from there. And who knows, you'll be able to attract so many different kinds of birds, whether they're herons, whether they're swans, whether they're songbirds, birds of prey, wading birds, grassland birds. You can also visit our, our YouTube channel because we have some of our sanctuaries posted for you to take a virtual walkthrough and where you'll be able to see what exactly some people have created for themselves in their habitats. Some of the local places that you can visit that are certified by Georgia Audubon as sanctuaries, meaning that they are great examples to look at in terms of having a very, very nice sanctuary. Depending on where you live, you can visit the Tapestry Community Garden the Wright Environmental Education Center, Dunwoody Nature Center, McDaniel Branch Wetlands, Deep Dean, Chattahoochee Nature Center, Lost Corner Preserve, there are so many. But I would say it's just important to start somewhere. Even if you're not much of an outdoor person, sometimes all it takes is just spending a good five minutes outside closing your eyes and listening to the world around you. Once you do that, you'll really be able to see or better yet understand just how large your habitat actually is. You can also check out our website for the Georgia Audubon Virtual Sanctuary Tour. But most importantly, 
everything that we do all starts with one plant. So identify an area you would like to serve as your sanctuary, whether that's your backyard, your front yard, your patio garden, your actual garden, or just your local green space. Try to figure out if you have invasive plants like English ivy or privet or kudzu and think about how you can get rid of them. Plant natives that are suitable for your unique green space or plant natives that are suitable for the birds you want to attract to your space and add features that are beneficial for all wildlife. Going back to what a habitat is, look at that space and ask yourself, is there food? Is there shelter? Is there water? And is there enough space? If you're looking for places to get native plants, Georgia Audubon does have um, plant sales, but you can also visit the Beach Hollow Wildflower Farm, Night Song Native Nursery, Nearly Native Nursery, the State Botanical Garden, and so many more. And the State Botanical Garden, as well as the Georgia Native Plant Society, have lists on their website that you can check out if you're curious or still unsure about what you can plant. And you could certify your yard if you want to with the certification program, but I think the most important part is just making sure that you are creating a sound habitat because ultimately we share our space with so many other things that we may not even see on a day-to-day -day basis. And whether they are insects or snakes, reptiles, or what are their birds? Georgia has 400 residential birds and migratory species and at least 200 to 250 of them are in Atlanta. So I encourage you to either open your eyes and take a look around or open your ears and just listen to the world around you. Almost half these species are songbirds, meaning that they, in the morning time and in the evening time, they will sing beautiful songs, all different, all unique. And after that, shorebirds make up the next largest group if you're on the coast. And Georgia is a part of the Atlantic Flyway, which is a route that many, many birds in North America take when they're migrating south to South America. So in the fall, particularly in October, Georgia is going to see a lot of migratory species come through and the more native plants and access to food that they have, the more successful their trips will be and the less birds we will have disappearing over the next few decades. So some of Georgia's more common and permanent residents would be your Eastern Tokis, which are the ones on the top left. Next to that, you have your American Robin. Next on the right, you have your Eastern Bluebirds. The two birds in the middle are the Georgia State Bird on the right, which is the Brown Thrasher with the bright yellow eye and the Carolina Wren right next to it with the round brown body. In your bottom left, you have the tufted titmouse. A tuft is kind of like a crown that points up. Cardinals also have them, as you can see on the bottom right. And in the middle of the bottom, you have the small but mighty Carolina chickadee. So once you're able to create a habitat, or if you already have one, you can enjoy all the wildlife, whether they're birds, squirrels, reptiles and amphibians or other wildlife that visit your yard, you truly did something amazing to make sure that they had a habitat. If you are curious about this program specifically or you want more resources for how you can really fix up your space, I encourage you to visit our website and learn more. We have some great resources there such as lists of native plants, the non-native plants, as well as picking the right plants or for birds or picking the right birds for plants. You can also subscribe to our Wildlife Sanctuary email list to learn more about that program and who's involved if you're interested.
And there are so many resources online, whether it's the Georgia Native Plant Society, our website, allaboutbirds.org, the Cornell School of Ornithology, which is K-12, or just your local library learning about birds. It's always fun to discover what is around you. And if you're interested in getting involved in citizen science, I encourage you to check out eBird or Nest Watch, or even check out our digital, our digital resources to learn more. You can join us, whether you wanna become a volunteer, become a master birder, assist with, assist with projects, or you're just curious to learn more. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. I thank you guys so much for your time. I hope that during my presentation, you were able to learn something new. And I hope you take this knowledge the next time you are in your yard or your green space or your habitat. Because remember, although our homes are our habitat, we also share that habitat with others and it's important for us to take care of it. So thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Ms. Kiana. That was a wealth of information. Um, I'm sure our audience have learned quite a bit. Um, I am going to share my screen because you mentioned, uh, let's see, if you can stop sharing, then I will be able to share. Okay. You mentioned two titles written by Douglas uh, Tallamy. And I just wanted to let our audience know that we do have those titles in our kind system. They simply need their library card and get, get on, log on to the gapines.org um, and place their books on hold or even check out our library to see if we have them. Um, in addition to other books that were not mentioned um, as a part of this presentation. But we are very much appreciative of this um, information that you shared with us, Kiana. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really just hope that I inspired somebody to learn something new. And if you learn something new, you can share that with somebody else. And that ultimately, that sharing of knowledge will help birds overall. Okay, great.